The optimism I found in Derby isn't shared by everyone, though, particularly because Rolls-Royce are cutting jobs in the area. I sat down with the MP for Derby South, Dame Margaret Beckett, the former Foreign Secretary and one of the longest-serving MPs in Parliament, and I started by asking her how resilient the economy is in Derby. I think in general terms, the economy should be very resilient because we have a, a, this um, high-quality, high-grade manufacturing with companies that are competitive across the world. But of course, the difficulty that we have now is that Brexit could potentially be putting a lot of that at risk. I mean, Rolls-Royce, for example, as you may know, has uh, decided to start licensing their big engines at their plant in Germany. And that is now a permanent move. Now, that's a, a smallish thing, but it's not a comfortable one because there's a lot of stuff that they could move to Germany or elsewhere in the world if they felt they should. At the same time, there has been some recent kind of investment in Indeed. Derby. So you've had Toyota, for example, just started to build their Corolla model there. JCB, where uh, we went to, um, is saying that they've created 50 new jobs. I mean, this doesn't seem the actions of companies too worried about Brexit. I, I shouldn't, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's important not to read too much into it because you're, you're right, and we have had substantial new investment for example, from Rolls-Royce, but that's now. We haven't left yet. You start asking people, talking to people about where they think they'll be in five or ten years' time. Where's Toyota going to look to put its next model investment? And I think you might find rather a different picture. So are you worried about jobs in Derby? Oh, then? very, very. And what do you think should happen? I've come to the view, with some reluctance, because I, I uh, respect the fact that we had this consultation, but I have come to the view that I take the Prime Minister's choices. What did she say? No deal, my deal, or no Brexit. I'm afraid I've come round to the no Brexit option. I mean, the difficulty is, you know, I spent the morning speaking to people in Derby, and overwhelmingly people were saying that they want MPs to get on with it, they want them to put party do. differences to one side and to sort this out. And actually, by going back to another referendum, you're not sorting out, are you? You're, you're washing your hands of it and saying it's too difficult. I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, I completely understand and, and totally sympathise, heaven knows, it's distorted everybody's lives, MPs most of all. But I think one thing that people haven't always taken on board is that if Mrs May's deal passes before the end of March, that will not be the end. That will just be the end of the preliminaries. If that goes through, if all the legislation's passed and there's a lot of it still to do, then the real negotiations begin. That's our future relationship with the European Union, what our trade deals are, not just with them, but elsewhere in the world, including the people we have trade deals with now as members of the European Union, that will all be in the melting pot. Those negotiations will begin when these are over. But your main problem though is, you're not gonna get a second referendum, are you? There's not much time left. You haven't got the parliamentary numbers to make it happen. I don't think anybody knows. I mean, one of the things the Prime Minister, whatever her failures, the Prime Minister has been extremely successful at one thing, and that is using the considerable power the government has to control the agenda of the House of Commons, to make sure that nobody really gets a chance to express a view in any context other than We've had lots of debates. Deal. We've had endless debate about Brexit. Endless debates, but decision has, been, has always been avoided and prevented. We, what we should have had weeks ago, months ago actually, is an opportunity for people to express preferences between the different alternatives. But she hasn't wanted that. She wants there to be only one alternative answer, and that's the deal she negotiated. You're not going to get a second referendum without the support of the Labour leader. And he's been pretty unenthusiastic, hasn't he? Jeremy has followed the pattern of the conference decision that our party made, which is that we um, look at the proposals, we put forward uh, proposals of our own, we look to call a general election, and then in the end, if none of that is going anywhere, we don't take off the table the option of a second referendum. And you say you're not going to get it, quite possibly not. But uh, when he wrote that letter to Theresa May spelling out his priorities for Brexit, he didn't even mention the idea of a second referendum. I mean, uh, then we're told that he forgot. Well, that's about as bad an excuse as a dog ate my homework, isn't it? Well, to be fair, the, the second referendum option, or the third actually, was not tied in to the, to the alternative deal. The, the pattern of the decisions was we look at the proposals, we put forward what we think would be a better alternative, if we think there is a better alternative, and if that fails, then we move on. 
So that's what he's done. Has he shown a lot of leadership on Brexit? I know that uh, there are a lot of people who would have liked him to take a stronger stance and perhaps earlier, but the important thing is where we get to in the end. Um, do you think that the party could actually split over Brexit? Because it does feel as if, I mean, I know the Conservative Party is grappling with the same problems, but if you look at the Labour benches, there are such different views when it comes to what should happen on Brexit. It does feel quite hard to um, hold this coalition together. Well, there are, different, there are different views right across the House of Commons. I mean, it's quite as straightforward as that. There are people, I know, who have been working desperately hard, people outside the Labour Party, who've been working hard for years to try to persuade the Labour Party to split. I think it's a big mistake. I, would, I hope none of my colleagues take that advice because it's the worst possible advice they can have, at the most basic and brutal. If you want to change an organisation, you don't change it by leaving it. What would the consequences be? It wouldn't be good for them or for the party. Now you, as someone who has been on the political front line for 40 years, have you ever seen another time like this? No. I, and, and indeed, Ken Clark and I have had this conversation. I have never seen such chaos. I have never seen a government that so utterly disregarded any expression of different views other than the ones they want to hear. I've never seen a government that treated Parliament with such contempt. It's absolutely unprecedented. The Prime Minister is tearing up our constitution. And what do you think the consequences of that could be? I think they could be very grave. Uh, I mean, if, if you have a government that can simply ignore the biggest defeat in parliamentary history and carry on as if it hasn't happened. I heard somebody say the other day, that one of the reasons the Prime Minister is so against having another vote of the people is because she doesn't like this thing whereby in other parts of Europe over the years sometimes people have gone back and said, you know, let's ask the question again because we didn't like the answer you gave the first time. She's doing that every day of the week. Now, someone else who's been in Westminster for uh, several decades as well is Jeremy Corbyn, someone you've known for a long time. Has he changed in those kind of 35 years or so that you've known him? Well, not until about the last three or four years. <laughs> uh, but being leader of the Labour Party is quite a life-transforming um, uh, episode. So, yes, he's changed In now. what sort of way? Well, he's grown. He's grown into the job. Um, I mean, I've heard Ken Clark say that he's become a perfectly competent leader of the opposition. And, you know, when he, when he first took on the post, he had had no experience of the kind of things that the leader has to do, which is a, a world away from the activities of an ordinary backbencher. And I think in the beginning, it's fair to say he struggled somewhat, but he's adjusted massively. Has he surprised you? Yes. And now, while I've got you, uh, I have to ask you, uh, Churchill, villain or hero? My father hated Churchill, I'm afraid. Uh, I know a lot of people. I think it's perfectly right and proper to have a genuine and sincere respect for the tremendous role that Churchill played alongside Attlee and others in the Second World War. But I think some of the hero worship has gone a bit far. And I say that with deep, uh, with deep respect to Nicholas Soames, who I, who I like and who is naturally very defensive and quite rightly so uh, about his grandfather. But I think sometimes it goes a bit over the top. Why did your why was it that your father hated them? Tony Pandy and all the rest of it. Thank you very much.